Lydia knows that practice makes perfect. Practice is how you acquire a skill. To the outsider, a skill like this can appear magical. The fingers dazzle, they seem to have a life of their own. And yet, every day, our own fingers perform equally amazing routines, like making tea, that demand the same degree of coordination. We take it for granted, it's second nature. Everything we do is interwoven with hard-earned skills, and yet, we still make mistakes. After all, we're only human. We're fallible. But does our skill help to prevent error or help to cause it? Could it be that practice makes us imperfect? Tenerife, 1977, the world's worst air crash. Two jumbo jets collide in fog. The verdict, human error. The headlines are tragically familiar. Always that same curious phrase, human error. Is it something remote from everyday life? Must disasters on such a terrible scale have equally awesome causes? Does a pilot make some special kind of error that we don't? In one sense, yes. The mistakes are different. If we were suddenly thrown, untrained, into a cockpit, we'd crash. We aren't pilots. We'd touch the wrong controls just as Lydia hits the wrong notes. This is the simplest, obvious kind of error. Lack of know-how. Lack of skill. In pilots, it's thankfully somewhat rare. It's when a pilot uses all that bravura skill that his mistakes in the cockpit are like ours in the kitchen. Take, as a case in point, the unconscious computer program we run in our heads when we want a cup of tea. Go to the tap and fill the kettle. Plug it in. Switch it on. Go to the cupboard and get the tea. Fill the pot. Get the sauces. Get the cups. Go to the fridge and get the milk. Pour the milk. Pour the tea. Why tea making? Professor Jim Reason, psychologist, Manchester University. Well, it's an interesting business tea making because it's a remarkably productive of error. And this is, I think, for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, it's something which is very automatic and we do it daily. And it's something we couldn't really bear to keep our minds on, even if we tried. It's also something which is episodic. Uh, one thing finishes and another thing has to follow it. We have to wait for these things to happen in sequence. And also it's something which we can't always tell visually where we are, should our minds be elsewhere. And we can make a whole range of different kinds of errors, and some of them I'm sure you recognize. Errors of tea making. One, omit key action. Prepare kettle, but forget to switch on. Two, select wrong program. Put coffee in teapot. Three, Lose place in program. Jump ahead. Pour water too soon. Four. Lose place in program. Repeat action already accomplished. Fill pot twice. Five. Forget intention. What have we come for? Six. Correct intention. Wrong object. Now, the interesting thing about these errors is uh, that they are not random or bizarre. We don't, for example, find ourselves blowing raspberries down the teapot. Uh, the errors we make are all part of the normal repertoire of skilled behaviour, and it is because the behaviour is so skilled that these particular kinds of errors occur. When we're still learning a new skill, we monitor what our hands are doing very closely. At this stage, hands and brain operate a kind of closed feedback loop, carrying out actions, checking for errors, feeding back corrections, trying again. This is the learning mode, and it demands our full concentration. But the more the brain becomes programmed by the repetition, the more we can relax our vigilance. With increasing practice, what happens is that 
one's control of action becomes more and more open loop. That's to say, we give it more and more to an autopilot or to some lower center of control uh, that doesn't seem to involve conscious attention. This conjurers on autopilot, the virtuoso mode. Simply switch on and forget it. The action program runs the hands and cards. The conscious mind can drift off elsewhere. Trouble is, once you've reached this stage, there's no going back. And in fact, uh, with a highly skilled activity, if you do attend too closely, then you actually disrupt the smooth flow of activity. If you're running downstairs and suddenly ask yourself, what are your feet doing? You're going to trip up and fall down the stairs. One of the problems, however, with this delegation of control is that these lower centers uh, that we give the control away to uh, seem to acquire an autonomy of their own so that once in a while uh, they take our actions along a direction that we didn't intend them to go simply because they're so recently and frequently used. Every time we use an action program, we strengthen its connections in the brain and weaken others. The way we always drive home is a strong route. Detours are not. Must pick up Lydia from the station. Must pick up Lydia from the station. If we normally go past the station turnoff and only rarely go down it, the chances are that the stronger route will win, especially if we're preoccupied. Well, the first thing I must do when I get in is pay that electricity bill. It's been lying. The strong programs wait like hijackers. A moment's distraction and the autopilot is captured. Go to the cupboard and get the tea. Go to the cupboard and get the tea. Go to the cupboard and get the tea. Go to the cupboard and get the coffee. Go to the cupboard and get the coffee. The stronger coffee routine has won. Other forms uh, of error involve uh, in attending to something when you really should not have attended, when your mind is probably best elsewhere. For example, in the tea making sequence, you can suddenly wake up from a daydream and ask yourself, where am I in the sequence? And you can come up with two kinds of wrong answer. You can say, I'm further along than I really am, and therefore uh, you find yourself making an omission. Uh, or you can say, I'm not as far along as I really am, and you can find yourself repeating an action. Uh, other kinds of errors seem to involve uh, something at a very low level where two action programs, or as we sometimes call them, action demons, seem to be competing uh, for the limited control of action, and we get some kind of blend of the two. Come in. One of the commonest forms of mental lapse is that where uh, we appear to be attending to something but are not actually taking it in. Uh, I think all of us know the example where we've apparently followed the words on a page with our eyes but at the end of the page we can't recall anything. So what happened then? You didn't. Oh, you didn't. Oh. Blunders in the kitchen cost nothing more than a little spilt milk. But can maddeningly trivial errors like these really cause major disasters? March 1977, on the small airstrip at Tenerife in the Canaries, two jumbo jets collide. The facts are simple. In thick fog, a KLM jet taxis onto the runway, followed by a Pan American plane. KLM is to turn at the end of the runway and wait there for takeoff. Meanwhile, Pan Am is to leave by the third exit and come up behind KLM. The first error. Pan Am misses the exit. He's still on the runway. The second error. KLM has not received takeoff clearance, but without warning, he suddenly takes off. At Tenerife, it's the kind of day that breeds errors. Thick fog, congested airport, only one radio channel, only one runway, overworked controllers, tired pilots. It's been a long day. Two minutes to five, KLM leaves the terminal and taxis onto the runway. Four minutes later, it's Pan Am's turn. The American captain calls up the tower. Tenerife, Clipper 1736. Clipper 1736, Tenerife. Uh, we're instructed to contact you and also to taxi down the runway, is that correct? Affirmative. Taxi to the runway and leave the runway third. Third to your left. Third to the left, okay? I think he said first. I'll ask him again. 
Would you confirm that you want the Clipper 1736 to turn left at the third intersection? The third one, sir. One... The airport's unfamiliar and the visibility is poor. The Pan Am crew find their way with a small map. I haven't seen any yet. I haven't either. And there's one. There's one. Exit C1, the first taxiway. That's the 90 degree. Okay. That's two. Yeah, that's that 45 there. Yeah. That's this one right here. Yeah, I know. Exit okay. C2, Pan Am heads for C3. Meanwhile, over a mile away, KLM is turning. KLM is now lined up for takeoff. Pan Am approaches C3. Next one's almost a 45, huh? Yeah. But it goes back. Uh, yeah, but it goes uh, ahead, I think. Uh, it's going to put us on the taxiway. Maybe he m maybe counts these as three. Hmm. They're confused. They've just realized that C3 slopes backwards. A Boeing jumbo is too wide to make this maneuver. Can this be the right exit? At this precise point, KLM calls the tower for its departure routing. The KLM 4805 is now ready for takeoff, and we are waiting for our ATC clearance. The KLM 8705, you are cleared to the... The Pan Am crew listen to this exchange intently. Their own departure routing will be the same. They concentrate. The first error. The plane slips past C3. No, I mean, this factor of preoccupation does keep cropping up in all kinds of errors, and uh, it isn't altogether dissimilar from the kind of error that we might make, say, in the kitchen, when we're intently listening to a phone conversation, we intend to pour just the normal amount of milk. We find ourselves, because we're so preoccupied, pouring the cup full. Poor visibility, uncertain plan, concentration on the radio. Pan Am have made the first error. It's five and three-quarter minutes past five at Tenerife. KLM are still requesting their departure routing. The KLM 4805 is now ready for takeoff, and we are waiting for our ATC clearance. The KLM 8705. The controller gives the ATC clearance, the route information, but includes the words... Right turn after takeoff. As we'll see, the phrase may have triggered off a strongly familiar action routine in the KLM captain's head. Yeah, where we go. Check first. The second error, he decides to roll. The plane gathers speed. The co-pilot hurriedly confirms the clearance. Uh, Roger, sir. We are cleared to the proper beacon flight, level 90, right to now 040 to intercept. He ends with the words, uh, We are now taking off. At this point, fate compounds the two errors. The tower can't see either plane, but hears KLM say, uh, We are now taking off and assume he means at takeoff position. The tower replies. Okay. Uh, stand by for takeoff. I will call you. But Pan Am on the same channel also hear KLM's message and jump in with their own warning. Uh, we are now taking off. Okay. And we're still taxiing down the runway. The Clipper 1736. But the two warnings overlap and cancel each other. KLM hears neither. Uh, we are now taking off. Okay. <laughs> 1736. And in fact, the OK seems to confirm their decision. Disaster is now inevitable. There he is. Look at him. That, the, the goddamn bastard is coming. Get off. Get off. Get off. Why would an experienced pilot like the KLM captain take off without clearance? Analysts have pointed to all the short-term factors that increase the chances of error, the fog, the single channel and so on, and also to the captain's worry about exceeding his duty hours. But there is another long-term factor which is possible, and that is something that the American Airline Pilots Association have called the training syndrome. Uh, that is the fact that uh, the KLM captain was the KLM's senior training instructor, and in the past six years had spent something like 15,000 hours training other pilots in the simulator. Now, in the simulator, general practice is 
for the instructor to give the clearances as if they were the air traffic control and to give the airways clearance and the takeoff clearance as one and the same. So it is possible that under this particular stress, the KLM captain might have reverted to this familiar habit, as we indeed do, that we have a tendency to fall back on well-established routines. Those routines are always waiting their chance. The coffee routine is more familiar than the tea. We're distracted. Coffee takes over. We're caught. Is this powerful influence avoidable? In specific cases, yes. It's now agreed that training captains should spend less time in simulators, that words like takeoff disappear from ATC clearances. We learn something from Tenerife as from every disaster. But are accidents still just the luck of the draw? Or are there factors that make our natural error tendencies worse? The more we interact with complex technology, the more we need to know about the interaction. Are there some people who have more accidents than others? And if so, can we avoid them? The Applied Psychology Unit of the Medical Research Council has been looking at road traffic accidents to see if they're related to the behaviour of individual drivers. If there really are error-prone people sitting behind the wheel of a car, how do we detect them? Who are they? Dr Ivan Brown. One way of characterising them is to uh, find out how dependent they are on the scene that they're actually perceiving. Now, uh, to use a, a jargon expression, certain people tend to be field dependent. Uh, what this means is that if you're looking at a complex scene or field or background, uh, then certain people tend, as it were, to get carried away by the scene as a whole, unable to break it down into its component parts, which are useful for the kind of task they're, they're trying to perform. They will be making mistakes, and some of those will result in accidents. You imagine driving through a very busy urban street. What you're trying to do is to pick out the important features, traffic lights, road signs, and so on. And these are seen against a whole background of advertisements, shop fronts, pedestrian activity. And what's likely to happen is, A, the person will overlook the thing that they're actually looking for, so they'll miss the sign, uh, which they're looking for to tell them to turn off to Oxford or something of this kind. Not only that, but they'll be spending so long in trying to get this information out of the scene uh, that they're almost behaving as if they've got tunnel vision, attaining to a very small amount of information at a time. They're just taking longer to get the information out, and therefore they tend to be rather hazardous. They like to overlook important things, for a start. If, for example, they were turning at a busy junction, for them, the important part of the field is the traffic coming along from their left, and so they tend to over-concentrate on this particular bit of the scene, forgetting that their car is actually pointing in another direction, and they would then tend to run down people who are crossing. Are you like this? This is the embedded figures test, and it can measure, with coloured cards, how field-dependent you are. Take a card. Somewhere in this pattern is hidden a simple shape. Can you find it? The time it takes you to spot it, it's up here, is a measure of your field dependence. This necktie shape can take some people two or three minutes to find. Some see it instantly, others never see it. Is this the key to accident proneness? It's a key. I mean, clearly, if uh, field dependence is a measure of a person's intellectual functioning, if you like, rather than simply the way he gets a part of a picture out of a complex scene, uh, then you would expect that, and we know that this, this trait transfers from one situation to another. And uh, I don't like the concept uh, of accident proneness because I think that's been misused over the years. But the field dependent person will tend to be accident prone, if you like, in all kinds of situations, on the road, uh, flying an aeroplane. If anybody's ever looked inside an aircraft cockpit, you'd realize that that complex scene has to be broken down into particular targets. And if you can't do that, if you're a field dependent and you can't do that, then you just can't fly the aeroplane. But these people, I think, are selected out very early on. And the kinds of tests that have naturally developed to pick out this ability in pilots have got rid of the field dependence. Now, the problem 
is slightly more difficult uh, in, say, car driving, where everybody expects to get a driving license if they can meet this, this fa fairly minimal criterion of just handling the vehicle in traffic. Um, now, in that situation, it wouldn't be socially acceptable to set some criterion of field dependence and say, sorry, you scored badly on this, this test with the coloured cards. We can't give you a licence. That would be uh, very unacceptable. Uh, so I think we have to adopt the other alternative, and that is to look for ways of finding out who's field dependent to the extent that they're likely to incur errors in a system like driving and then devise ways of retraining them. This would uh, largely involve training their visual scanning patterns, making their visual search much more efficient. But even if you've got good scanning patterns and you pick out important details at once, can the technology itself encourage error? Ergonomics is about where your hand goes automatically in an emergency. If it goes to the wrong knob or turns it the wrong way, ergonomics has failed, and it can cost more than just a burnt saucepan. Remember this. Pointed to take charge of the emergency at the damaged nuclear power plant in Pennsylvania has said that human error was to blame for the accident which led to a leak... Run yourself a little began. scenario. Here's the control room of a nuclear power plant, not unlike Three Mile Island. And here, well-trained and efficient are you, the operator. The alarm goes. On your neat and tidy panel, every knob's the same. So which one do you reach for? And is it the right one? And what if the duplicate panel across the room is an exact mirror image of it? Makes wonderful decor, but does your hand go left or right? And careful here, only one dial goes clockwise, the other's mirror image. And when top left relates to bottom right and top right relates to bottom left, try sticky tape, a do-it-yourself safety system. Two identical knobs. This one's fine tuning. This one shuts down the plant. In your million dollar control room, you tell them apart like this, with beer taps. Without them, you'd keep hitting the wrong knob and guess who'd get the blame. For the poor operator, do-it-yourself markings are less painful. So you need a stool to read the top dial. What happens in a crisis when you can't find the stool? And even changing a warning light can be tricky. In 1978, one operator dropped the bulb into the open panel. It shut down the entire plant and most of the safety systems. Hitting the right button is the concern of Dr. David Embry, ergonomist, Aston University. Unfortunately, the examples that we've been looking at are extremely common. Um, virtually any power station that one goes into, both in this country and the USA, there are many situations where the operator is set up to make errors by the poor design of the information that he's presented with. They really they don't stand a chance because the situation is so configured that they are certain to make an error. These are all classic human factors, uh, ergonomics principles, which uh, any uh, beginning ergonomist will know about, and it seems very strange that they're not incorporated into very high-risk situations, such as nu nuclear power plant operation. The beer taps do what a good designer should, spot a conflict between similar action routines and make them as different as possible. Three Mile Island Control. Ergonomists are still listing design faults. Textbook stuff. Bad design not only encourages error, it can turn simple errors into accidents, making the consequences of a momentary lapse into a major disaster. All this, at least, we can do something about. Clearer controls, collapsible steering, better seat belts we can make the environment safer. But the real fault lies not in our ergonomics, but in ourselves. Naturally enough, uh, in the past, accident researchers have spent most of their time looking at uh, serious accidents. Uh, one of the changes that is now coming about is that psychologists and accident researchers are, are becoming more interested in everyday 
uh, inconsequential errors on the reasonable assumption that they are really no different from the errors with sad consequences, that they have the same kinds of psychological causes and the same kinds of biases underlying them. Uh, they have a number of advantages, obviously, is that they're not rare occurrences like serious accidents, and uh, they happen literally right under our noses. If I was in the kitchen and I wanted to turn on the kettle and I turned on the toaster, then I'd be mildly embarrassed. If I made the same error on the flight deck of an aircraft, it could well uh, end in a catastrophe. The difference between these two situations is not, uh, I suspect, the causes of the error, the things that actually cause the error to come about, but whether or not the environment is forgiving or less forgiving. Fortunately, most environments are forgiving, just as well. For virtually nothing we do that's skilled, from playing the piano to driving a car, goes through our conscious mind at all. Our autopilot runs the gear stick, the clutch, the steering, and not badly at that. In return, our conscious mind can write sonnets, design jumbos, do everything that being human means. An absent mind is only one that's present somewhere else. One can imagine a situation where one was entirely present-minded, where you had to control all your actions with limited uh, capacity attention. The whole thing would be infinitely boring. We'd never get out of bed. But we do get out of bed. We are active. We use our skills. And there's a price. We make mistakes. Error is the price of skill. But it's like selling your soul to Mephistopheles. You hope he'll be forgiving when it's time to pay.